All right, good morning, everybody. Thinking about just seeing if, uh, if we can find Ezra, that boy that uh, did announcements, just come up here and just do this. So cool. All right, welcome to winter. Somebody came and told me this morning, I, th- I think that's fitting. Um, if you'd like to turn, uh, turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Job, uh, I'll give you a minute to, to flip through. Back in the Old Testament, just before the book of Psalms, um, I'll, I'm reading through in the uh, ESV version, a little different. Wes uses the uh, New American Standard. I'll be in ESV, so if you want to follow along on your phone, you can change your version if you'd like to. So, um, My name's Todd. Uh, I'm the production director here at the Rock Church, for those of you who do not know me. Uh, myself and my wife, Lisa, also uh, along with Nick and Kelly and Tom and Kim, we lead the, the marriage ministry here as well, which is awesome. Uh, and so lots of, lots of good things uh, uh, going on here. Um, one of the things that you know, kept coming to my mind uh, throughout the summertime uh, was these, this verse from John. You don't have to turn there. Uh, but Jesus, speaking to his disciples, uh, he says, in this world, you will have tribulation. He says, in this world, in other versions, it says, in this world, you will have trouble. I thought about that a lot this, this summer, uh, especially in my life. But Jesus, speaking to his disciples here, warning them, he, he, he was trying to prepare them for what was to come. He was about to, be, to go and be crucified. And he's, he's telling them, you know, he, he doesn't say, uh, in this world, you might have trouble if you do these certain things or don't do these certain things. He doesn't say, you know, in this world, there, there could be trouble or tribulation. He says, in this world, in this broken and sinful world in which I am leaving you here, that, that you, there will be trouble. Expect it. Understand that there will be tribulation in your life. We live in a very broken world. I don't know if you guys have noticed at all. Uh, It's a broken place. This world is broken. It has been broken by sin since Adam and Eve. And after thousands of years of of us trying to fix it, thousands of years of medical advances and and, uh, technology and computers and, and iPhones that can literally do anything that I could possibly ask it to do just about, I guess, uh, you know, all of this technological advances, all these medical advances, all of these innovations, all of these ways in which we try to make life easier so that we won't have any trouble, and yet still, Jesus was right. There is still trouble in this world. No matter what we do to try to fix it, no matter what we do to try to, uh, to mend all of the problems, they seem to keep popping up, no matter what we do. So since we're dealing with this, this, this very old problem, I thought it would be fitting to, to go back to one of the oldest written books in the Bible, if not the oldest, the book of Job. It tells a story of a man who we'll learn a little bit about here. Uh, we'll start in Job uh, 1, uh, just the first couple verses, verses 1 through 3, so let's read them. It says, there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. So we meet this guy named Job. He sounds like a pretty good dude. He's fearing God. He's, he's following. He's trying to do his best. That doesn't mean that he was perfect or sinless or didn't have any, you know, uh, any struggle with sin because we, we know that we are all uh, have that struggle, every human being on this, uh, on this, in this world. But it does say that he was blameless and upright. He was trying to follow God in every way of his life. He had a healthy fear and reverence of God in his life. He was a good guy. Verse 2 says, There were born to him seven sons and three daughters. So he was blessed with a a family. He possessed 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and very many servants, so that this man was the greatest of all the people in the east. So we meet this guy, he's, he's a good guy, he's trying to follow after God, and he's got a lot of great stuff. He's blessed. You know, back in that time, you weren't blessed with, you know, dollar bills and gold bars. It was how many uh, uh, people you had working for you and how many uh, animals that you had. That was your wealth, and he was very blessed. He had a lot of great things. Life was going along, as many of us uh, and many times of our life, 
You know, we're, we're just kind of trucking along through life. We're going to work. We're taking care of our family. We're trying to follow after God. We're going to church. We're doing this. We're doing that. And then all of a sudden, things happen. Things change. Life throws a curveball at us. This happens to Job as well. We'll skip down a few verses to verse 13. It says, Now there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, and there came a messenger to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them, and the Sabians fell upon them and took them and struck them down and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. And yet while this guy was in there telling, another one comes, and he says, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. And yet while he was still speaking, another one comes in and says, The Chaldeans have formed three groups and made a raid on the camels and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped. And yet while he was still telling him this, another comes in. And says, your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And behold, a great wind came across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young people. And they are all dead. Sometimes this can happen in our life, can it? Things are going seemingly fine, doing the best we can doing the right things, we're trying to to do all the right things, we're trying to follow after God, and all of a sudden all these things happen. Health problems hit, people end up in hospitals, lose family members, relationships struggle, jobs are lost, finances struggle, all these different things that happen in life, all these different struggles, big, small, all of a sudden one thing after another after another sometimes in our life. The reason I said this reminds me a lot of, I was thinking of, about this a lot uh, this summer is because I, I felt a little bit like Job throughout different times in my life, but especially this summer, a lot of little things, not, not anywhere near as, as, uh, as, uh, as awful as what Job is going through here. But this summer... Life was going well, and we were trucking along, and uh, my wife and kids and I were enjoying, you know, enjoying life and summertime and, uh, and our home and all these things, and uh, one of these storms came through, one of the, like, I don't know, like 150 storms that came through this year, uh, and, and, you know, we're, we're just sitting there uh, before I was uh, heading out to, to the church in the morning, and uh, power goes out, big lightning strike, big bang, and, uh, and then it came back on about an hour later, and we didn't have any water. We're trying to figure out why we didn't have any water. Well, I guess the lightning struck our well and blew out the well pump. So we're sitting here, we're, you know, dealing with this problem. We got, you know, it's expensive fixing the, the well and, 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 all these, and all these things. And then a few days later, uh, I, I go down to the, the bottom, lower level of our house and like, you smell something down here? Something doesn't smell right down here. I kept trying to look around, trying to figure out what's going on. And after all this investigation and tearing stuff up and jackhammering holes in my floor and all these other things, I figured that there, I found that there's a sewer pipe under our house that's leaking, which is no fun, uh, in case you were wondering. It's a mess. Trying to sort through this thing, you know, in the middle of all this trouble, I got, you know, uh, air hammers out, concrete chipped out, I've got holes in stuff, cut drywall open, all these things, trying to track this thing down, trying to figure out what's going on. And then storm number like 243 rolled through this year, and the power was out for a whole week, so I'm running things on generators, and, you know, we're hauling water from all this stuff's going on, you know, I got all these messes happening. It's like one thing after another after another. We're going to bed one night, let our dog out. Go to let the dog back in. You smell that? It smells like a skunk. <laughs> Open the door. Oh, yeah, that's a skunk. Dog went out and found a friend to play with, I guess, in the woods. And so we got this dog with, you know, if you've ever had that, it's <laughs> like, what do you do, you know? We're trying to buy all this shampoo and all these things, trying to get the smell out of this dog. Dealing with that. A couple weeks later, we all came down with COVID. <laughs> you know, we're all sick and feeling awful. And 
one thing after another, after another, after another. You just, you know, sometimes we, we go through this. If you haven't been through this, praise the Lord. If you haven't been, you know, had a time like this in your life, praise God. Um, but it's a real thing, and it happens. It happens, it happens at some points to everybody in different ways. You know, sometimes a lot more serious things than what happens to us, but uh, we try to figure out why, right? Like, why does this happen? I, I, what did I do? Did I do something wrong? Was it my fault? I thought I was doing all the right things. You know, we ask God, maybe. Why, why did this happen? Why, why did this happen? Job went through the same struggle. I don't think this was easy for him. The Bible says he struggled. He struggled with God. He struggled trying to figure out, why did these things happen to me? Why have you taken? I was just going along. I had a beautiful family. I had a house. I had barns. I had servants. I had animals. I had all of these things in my life. And then all of a sudden, one day, just like that, everything is gone. It even goes on to say that Job's health was attacked, that he ended up with boils all over his body. He was sick. Literally everything had been taken from him. And he's trying to figure out why. So Job's, uh, if, if you read kind of through, you know, the middle of this book, it's a good chunk of the middle of the book of Job. Job's dealing with these, these friends that come his way. And they're trying to rationalize God's sovereignty in his life. And they're trying to figure out what happened, Job? What did you do wrong? You must have done something wrong. And they keep going back and forth. What did you do? Did you offend God in this way? Did you do this thing? Have you done this? What you mu- there's a reason for There's got to be a reason for this. And Job keeps coming back and saying, no, I have not done these things. I have not sinned against God. I have not angered him. I have not done all these things. Remember in the beginning, it says that Job was a blameless before the Lord. He was, he was clean at that time. He was trying to do his best to follow after God. But, but yet, he still struggled with trying to understand why did this happen to me? Why, I don't understand. What is the reason? Now, Job, sometimes we, we want to relate with Job and we want to say, yeah, I'm blameless, I'm righteous too. You know, I don't understand. This is my fault. But sometimes we can relate more to Jonah. Sometimes we can be more like Jonah than we can be like Job. Jonah, being a prophet, God asked him to go and, and, uh, and share a message of repentance and hope with the city of Nineveh, and Jonah doesn't say no to God. He just kind of acts like he didn't hear him and just gets on a boat and tries to go the other direction. Like, how many times have you done that in your life? God asking you to do something, nudging you to do something, or stop doing something, and you're like, eh, I didn't hear you. And then Jonah ends up finding himself out on a ship somewhere, right? In the middle of a stormy sea. God's allowing the storms to come on him and the guys that he's with because now Jonah's sin is affecting the people around him. And the guys are asking the same question. Who brought this upon us? And Jonah's like, yeah, it was me. Just throw me over the boat. Sometimes we can be more like Jonah. And sometimes when things happen in our life, sometimes, I'm not saying all the time, please understand, please hear me here, Sometimes we do need to take a hard look at our life. And sometimes we do need to, like David says in the psalm, he says, search me, O God. Search me for sin in my life. How can I, have I, have I turned against God? Have I sinned against you? Is this part of God's loving discipline in my life trying to guide me back to the path that God wants me on? Sometimes that is the case, but not always. Sometimes, we just live in a sinful and broken and messed up place. And that's just the truth of it. This world is broken. <clears throat> this world is broken. And sometimes things are out of our control and th- sometimes things happen. So what? we may not understand it. We always try to explain it. We always try to rationalize it. And I think that's good. I think Job did that. I think we do that. So I was in the military and... Uh, uh, went through airborne uh, school, and some people, when I say that, they're like, oh, cool, you like sky, you went skydiving. That sounds like fun. It's not the same thing as skydiving exactly. It's more like they fly the plane as low as possible to the ground and then kick you out and hope that you make it as fast as possible without getting hurt. That's kind of a su- summary of airborne. Uh, So, you know, you go through school, it's a very dangerous thing. It's very, um, there's a lot of things that need to happen just right in order for you to 
uh, jump out of that plane, have your parachute deploy, and then you want to get to the ground as quickly as possible, of course, because people are shooting at you and other things, which is not fun. So you, you learn all of these, these techniques, and you train, and, you, and you know, over and over and over, you learn how to land on the ground. You'd think that people would know how to like, jump and like, land on the ground, but they teach you how to do that over again in case you didn't know, and they teach you a special way to do it. And they teach you how to you know, pack all of your equipment and how to walk with your equipment on and how it should look and what it should, you know, should feel like and where to carry your, your, your weapon and your ammo and, and all these things. And when you get into the airplane, there's a certain way that you get in, a certain way that you sit down. And then when the, uh, uh, when the airplane, you know, takes off and it gets in the air and they get to the, the spot where you're getting ready to, to jump out, uh, everybody stands up and everybody hooks up their, their line, which is attached to their parachute. Uh, so you don't get to actually control this parachute. It just deploys on its own when you jump out of the plane. Uh, and you hook up this, this, uh, this hook to this cable and everyone stands there uh, in, in utter fear or excitement, uh, ready to jump out of this plane. And, and, and everybody, you know, you, there's a big light at the front, you know, green, green light, uh, red light, whatever, it's, it says red. And when, that, when they open the door and when they, that light turns green and they say, go, 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 everyone runs out of the plane like something's chasing you and you just jump out the door. Uh, seconds after you jump out the door, your parachute deploys and you float safely to the ground. At least that's what's supposed to happen. A good friend of mine uh, jumped, uh, uh, you know, training in the Army uh, quite often, quite more than I did. He went through that same process, did all the things, checked all of his gear, got on the plane, go, 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 jumped out, something went wrong. The cord that's attached to that, that wire in the airplane somehow got wrapped around his arm. He jumped out that plane. It grabbed his arm and it drug him behind that airplane. It drug him behind that airplane for a long time. They couldn't pull him in, couldn't cut him loose. They actually had to land that airplane with him dragging behind it. They sprayed the stuff out on the runway they actually have a process for this. He survived. We used to call him Popeye because his, his, his arm was, he had, he had one big muscle because it actually like, it, you know, it really severed the muscle in his arm. Great guy. But sometimes we would ask him afterwards, we'd talk to him about it. What happened? What happened? What'd you do? What, did you do something wrong? Was it someone else's fault? Whose fault was it? What, what went wrong? You, you, and, and he would tell us, like, I did everything I thought I was supposed to do. I followed all the rules. I, I, I did you know, everything that they asked me to do. I kept, you know, uh, checked all my equipment. I, I, you know, it wasn't wrapped up. I don't understand. I don't understand why things went wrong. I don't understand where they went wrong. And sometimes we never fully understand we never fully understand why things happen in our life. We never fully can understand why bad things happen. We never can fully grasp what it is. Job came to this same conclusion. He struggled to understand why did this happen? Whose fault was this? And he finally cries out to God in chapter 38. He cries out to God and he says, God, what is, you? please come here and explain to me what is, caused this to happen in my life? Why has all this pain and suffering and all these things are lost? What in the world is going on? I'll read a little bit of this, but God answers him in, in, in several chapters in the center of this book. But Job 38 verse 4, we'll start here. God responds to Job's question and he says, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me. If you have understanding, who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb? When I made clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band? and prescribed limits for it, and set bars and doors, and said, Thus far you shall come, and no farther. And here shall your proud waves be stayed. Have you commanded the morning since your days began, and caused the dawn to know its place? 
God answering Job here kind of facetiously and in a kind of poetry. He says, Job, you're going to ask me this question. Do you understand how this whole universe works? Do you understand how the earth is held together? Were you there when I created everything and set the stars in the sky and the water on the land and raised the, the land, you know, and made the land dry ground for us to walk on? Were you there when I created human beings and animals? And do you understand how all that stuff works? And you're going to ask me uh, to explain to you these things. The answer that Job got and what he realized was that God is sovereign over everything in this world. He is greater than everything that may happen in this world. We only see a little glimpse in our lives of what God's plan might be. We only see a little bit. When we go through tribulation, when we go through trouble, when we have hard times, that's all we see. But God has a bigger plan. God has a bigger plan for each and every one of us. God has a bigger plan for this world. God has a bigger plan for all kinds of things. We don't see all of that. We only see this little bit and this little part. And what God is reminding Job is that I am sovereign over all of it, Job. I am sovereign over this entire universe. I cared for it all, and I will care for you, and I have a reason and a purpose that you may not understand. Back in the beginning of the book of Job, we skipped over a scene where Satan is speaking and, 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 and God and Satan are having this discussion about Job. And God trusts that Job will be faithful. And Satan is attacking him, but Job doesn't know this. Job doesn't know that that all took place. Job doesn't know that he's being attacked by the enemy. Job doesn't know that God knows and that God has got him. But Job is faithful even though he struggled. It says back in Job 2, we'll turn there really quickly, uh, Job 2, 9, he has this, this little conversation with his wife. Somebody laughed because they, they know this. Job 2, uh, verses 9 and 10. So after all these things happened to Job, all the suffering, loss of his family, she comes to him and she says, do you still hold fast your integrity? Are you still going to follow God? Curse God and die. Now, first of all, if Job and his wife were here, I may recommend our marriage mentorship program, (laughs) which... Uh, We have a lot of great mentors uh, that could help maybe work through some of the the anger and things that are going on here. All right. She doesn't give him real good advice. Verse 10 says, but he said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women who speak. Shall we receive good from God and shall we not receive evil? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. This is a Job he didn't curse God. He struggled. We, we all struggle. Man, we're in the middle of a storm in our life. We struggle. We wonder. We question. That's normal. Job did it. But it doesn't give us a free right to sin against God. And it does teach us that we need to have faith in him and trust that there's something going on that we may not understand. We may not see the big picture when we're going through something like that. Sometimes, you know, I, I think about what happened to that, that friend of mine, PFC Locke, his name was. I think about what happened to him. I think about what happens in our life, you know, and, I, and I, sometimes I think how many people's lives were saved because of what happened to him? How many policies were changed and adjusted? How many people were encouraged to be extra safe and careful How many things were checked over? How many faults were found in the system that was in place? How many people's lives were saved down the road? How many people were encouraged by the story that he's been through? How is God using his life right now? We don't know. He didn't know. 
all he saw was something awful happen to him. And sometimes that's all we can focus on is, is the awful thing right in front of us. Sometimes we've got to take a step back and realize that God is sovereign over everything. And then we have to have faith and we have to trust in him. Romans 5. Look to the New Testament. Jesus comes onto the scene many thousands of years later. He talks about similar things. Romans 5, 1. It says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we also have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the spirit who has been given to us. Because of the faith that we put in God, because of the faith that we put in Jesus Christ, when we go through tribulation, when we go through trouble in our life, we can step back and we can trust that God is using this for a greater purpose, that God is going to help us to endure and train us. And maybe sometimes we're being refined through a trial. Because it's not really about the trial, it's about how we handle the trial. It's about what we do in the trial. How are we acting in the trial? How are we handling what God or sometimes the enemy is throwing at our life? How are we dealing with that? Are we trusting in God? Are we having faith in Him? Are we looking to see all of the miracles that may happen on the other side? It says at the very last chapter, the very last few verses of the book of Job, after all that struggle, and all that questioning and all that, the things that Job went through says that God restored him. God restored everything he had. God restored all the things, all, all the, even, even brought him abundance in his family again, two times what he had before. Sometimes we can't see that that might be at the end of the road. That might be at the end of the struggle. Once we get through these things, that there's something greater that we need to look forward to. Sometimes we can't see that. We need to be reminded being refined. God is in control. I love that. We rejoice in our sufferings. That's not normal, is it? That's the last thing that I want to do when I'm suffering is rejoice. But because of what Jesus Christ has done in our lives, because of the faith that we have in him, we can look different when things go wrong in this world. And that speaks louder to the world. That speaks louder to a broken world than almost anything we can do. When you're going through a mess in your life and you got a smile on your face and you're still praising God, people are going to wonder what the heck is wrong with you. And it's a good wrong with you. It's a good thing. It's a good thing for them to see. It's a good thing for your family to see as you go and visit with them and, and be close to them throughout this holiday season. It's a good thing for the people at work to see how you're handling struggles, trials, and tribulation because you're a bright light in your community, and in, in all those that you're, uh, uh, people that you're around. I read part of that verse from John at the beginning. Let's flip there really quick as we finish out here. It's in the book of John. John 16. John 16, 33. Jesus is speaking to his disciples. He's warning them about the trouble that they will face. <clears throat> he says, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. Because in this world you will have tribulation. But take heart. I have overcome the world. Jesus has already won. The Bible says that when we believe upon the cross, when we believe upon what Jesus Christ has done, that when we understand the sin that is in all men, 
the sin that separates us from a righteous and holy and almighty God. And we look to the cross and we look to what Jesus Christ did for us. That he died to pay that price once and for all so that we may be set free from truly being under the curse of this world. We defeat it. We're set free from the sin of this world. We have an eternal hope in Jesus Christ. We have something greater to look forward to at the end, to spend eternity with God. That is what Jesus Christ offers us. And we start to look at it through that lens. Whatever trial you might be going through right now, whatever struggle you might be going through right now, whatever thing is falling down around you, one after another after another may be going on right now in your life, you can look to the cross of Jesus Christ and find hope. Nothing in this world can defeat us when we put our faith in Jesus. As the band comes up, I uh, just want to take a few minutes and just reflect on you know, what that might mean in your life. What, is that, what does that look like to you? What, what, what struggle are you going through? Maybe you're not going through something right now. Praise God. Maybe tomorrow you will be. Maybe you got a friend or a family member that's going through something right now. Maybe they're facing the tribulation, the trials in this world. Maybe they need hope. It's hard enough for somebody who believes in Jesus Christ who has that hope. It's hard enough for us sometimes, isn't it, to go through hard times and look to God and say, thanks. It's hard. But if you're sitting in here today or you're listening online and you don't have that hope in your life, you don't understand what Jesus Christ has done for you, or you haven't truly put your faith in him for eternal hope, something that doesn't fade, something that doesn't fall down, something that doesn't go away. Maybe you're out there putting your, 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 uh, your hope in other things. Maybe it's money and relationships, jobs. Maybe it's busyness. Maybe you're putting your faith in things. Maybe you're, you're chasing after what's going to fill this gap in my life? What's going to fill this hole? I'm missing something. I, I, it's got to be the next thing will, will, will make me happy. The next thing will bring me joy. The next promotion, that's when I'll be happy. I'll be good after that. After we get to this level of income, after we buy this house, after I have this husband or this wife, I'll be happy. But what happens when those things fall apart? What happens when jobs fail, health fails, relationships struggle? What happens when those things that you've put your hope and your faith in crumble around you, you're left with nothing? The only thing that can truly get us through is surrendering to Jesus Christ. Surrendering your life once and for all, giving it over to him and saying, God, I'm done chasing this world. I'm done chasing the things of this world. Lord, I want to chase you now. Let's pray. Dear Lord, uh, Thank you for your son. Thank you for Jesus. The peace that he offers us. The hope that he gives us. In this world, we will have tribulation. God, you told us. You warned us. And you gave us the answer, too. told us the way. He told us the way through. Sometimes we don't want to give it up. Sometimes we don't want to truly believe. We don't, we don't think it'll work. God, we know it works. We know Jesus is the answer. We know that true peace in our hearts can only come through him. The Bible tells that you've left so much for us to learn from and so much for us to see. God, I ask that you stir in each of our hearts, Lord, whatever way it needs to be stirred. Did you draw us closer to you right now in a struggle in our life? Did you draw us closer to you, Lord, maybe for the first time? And you bring about a real change in our life once and for all. 
And then when the, the waves hit, when the storms come, we will stand firmly upon the rock of your salvation. And we'll be set free from the pain and the suffering. God, I ask that you bless us, that you guide us, and that you draw close to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.